Now we have research on fluoride, 15 years of it, on its effect on the brain. It lowers your child's IQ by four to nine points, and a pregnant mother can affect her fetus. It starts then. I would like if everyone gets tested for the oral microbiome, and that dentists and patients alike have respect for this oral microbiome, have an understanding, a comprehension of why it's the root of everything. Hey everyone, before diving into the episode, I want to take a moment to invite you into our Mind Body Green ecosystem, where you can explore the infinite possibilities of health and well being. All you have to do is click the subscribe button to hear more thought provoking interviews with leaders in the health space. I am so grateful for all of you who have tuned in over the years, and let me tell you, it's only going to get better. We breathe north of 20,000 times a day, yet we're not talking about breathing, whether it's nasal breathing or mouth breathing, in the context of oral health. Mark, tell us what's going on here. Jason, uh, thanks. Um, you're right. I mean, we all assume since we've been doing it for so long from birth uh, that we're good at it and we don't, we take it for granted. We have taken breathing for granted. I think James Nestor did a great job of uh, illustrating that um, in his book, Breath. Um, there are, I mean, let, I'll just go right to the oral health implications. Uh, other than a dentist being able to be a great person to be able to tell you very quickly whether you are a nose breather, able to breathe through your nose properly, uh, whether you're a mouth breather. But simply put, if you breathe through your mouth, if you are a mouth breather, breathing through your mouth, um, you are going to have oral health issues and complications. And that's because, if assuming that, if you understand the concept that breathing through your mouth is not a good thing for many reasons, but in terms of oral health, it is affecting the pH of your saliva. It is lowering the pH of your saliva. It's drying out your mouth. Your mouth needs a certain amount of saliva to function properly. Saliva is the life giver in the mouth. It supports the oral microbiome and it helps prevent decay, cat tooth cavities, gum disease. It activates the immune system. It allows us to speak and swallow and digest foods. Of course, there are other op, uh, other uh, reasons for uh, the importance of saliva. But mouth breathing in itself, if you are mouth breathing during the day, but also at night, I mean, that's a six to eight hour stint of just sitting there breathing through your mouth. Also, saliva flow drops normally while you sleep, which is normal. Um, that's a long stint of having to put up with a lower pH in the mouth and a, a, a kind of a dysbiosis of the oral microbiome, an unhealthy state of the oral microbiome because there isn't enough saliva. So it's best to breathe your nose unless you're talking and eating. So I, I heard cavities in there. Am I, am I hearing right that you are more likely to have cavities if you are a mouth breather? It's funny. Um, you know, I figured that out about 15 years ago because it's not in the dental curriculum. Um, and then I started making, you know, the association and realizing that, you know, my kids that were mouth breathing, they had a different consistency of saliva. You could see the biofilm on the tooth. We called it a furry biofilm or plaque layer on the tooth. Uh, these were all mouth breathers. Uh, and, and now it's clearly known that that is an issue because of our knowledge of the oral microbiome. Ironically, back to James Nestor, uh, he sent me, while he was researching his book, he sent me a quote from a dental textbook from the late 1800s saying that mouth breathing is an issue when it comes to decay. And then it was dropped and forgotten. And now we, we see it, but, but it's not, it was not taught in dental school. Yes. So your incidence of decay, gum disease, bad breath, anything to do with the oral microbiome, not being well, not being able to do its job, a dys dysbiosis, it's like the gut microbiome, uh, that will lead to decay, gum disease, it, it's it's a it's a immune response disorder. Um, if the oral microbiome can't defend what's going on in the mouth, you're these diseases will pop up and decay is right up there. So if I think of the things we're doing every day, breathing obviously, need to breathe, breathe to live. So that, that's top of mind. Then I think about our, our oral health routine, there's brushing. I, I personally, what I do, I wake up, I go go pee and then I brush my teeth. And then before I go to bed, I brush my teeth and, and floss. Shoot, is, is that 
Correct. Should I be doing that? Well, no, that's that's great. And unfortunately, as the the profession has kind of um, amplified that message that if you're not doing that, all hell will break loose. And that's true to an extent, but it's not the only part of the equation. You can still have a very poor diet. You can still be mouth breathing, for example, and you can be the perfect flosser and brusher, which is, that's what I do. I brush when I get up in the morning, not after breakfast. And then I brush before bed. Uh, I've been trying to move that up a little bit, especially during the winter. We can talk about that on why, but, and then flossing, uh, and flossing once a day is fine. Sometimes twice a day is, is, is better for some, but, but I, I don't know how many times you've heard when you've been to the dentist and you get a cavity and you're like, most people will ask why, or what can I do to prevent that? And the dentist will, or the hygienist and dentist, uh, will say, you know, you got to brush and floss more. And that's the wrong message because there's so much more to oral health. And that's the root cause. Uh, that's discussing the root cause of oral disease. And it's diet, it's epigenetics, mouth breathing, it's uh, uh, toxins. Um, diet is the big one. But brushing and flossing, that's not the only thing that saves us. In fact, just doing that alone and not doing everything else correctly, you're still going to have decay. So we're going to touch on all of that. We're, of course, going to touch on diet. But if I'm brushing my teeth, the next question I'm sure everyone's thinking is, well, what should I be brushing my teeth with? There's toothpaste, all sorts of toothpaste. There's fluoride, there's whitening, there's natural, it runs the gamut. What's your, let's talk about toothpaste. What, what do we look for in a toothpaste, in your opinion? You know, we've done a really terrible job uh, of that as, as a profession. The consumer is confused. Um, we've... Let me go way back. So toothpaste is a necessary evil, and it's, again, based on diet. So when our diet changed two, 300 years ago, it got particularly worse at the turn of the last century. Uh, you know, Cheerios, fr fr uh, cereals, crackers, all these processed uh, re refined carbohydrates. And, and I'm also including sugar and candy and all that, but, but I want to enlarge that that picture, it can be a, a, a saltine cracker, for example, or Cheerios, which often, if you read the box, is is um, touted as a health product, good for your heart. Uh, these are products that increase the the uh, incidence of decay so much so that before I think it was World War II, actually it was World War One, uh, there was a real problem. The GIs had terrible teeth; they were in a lot of pain, and GIs don't do well when they are in pain on the front line. So they actually uh, invented toothpaste. They introduced toothpaste. Uh, there was a national campaign. They actually hired a psychologist to kind of move the needle in terms of behavior. How are we going to motivate people to brush? And the toothpaste that we developed back then basically came out of the back of a covered wagon snake oil salesman. I mean, it was soap. It was a detergent. And, uh, and that's the way it's been up until this point. We still have those toothpaste and it's a huge market, a big profit maker and boutique brands now are beginning to change that. Fluoride is hopefully on its way out soon. Fluoride is a neurotoxin for infants and fetuses. So what to use? Um, I would use a fluoride free toothpaste that is surfactant and emulsifier free without essential oils in it. Now, having said that, most of your listeners will say, well, does that even exist? Right. Tell me some brands. I'm going shop. I've formulated a toothpaste. Uh, I've brought it to market, so I know how difficult this is. Uh, I would say a clay-based toothpaste is good. Uh, I think Primal Organics has that. Our toothpaste, FIG, F-Y-G-G, -G, which stands for Feed Your Good Guys, is emulsifier surfactant free and EO free, essential oil free, all these botanicals, there's no data that it, it supports the oral microbiome. If anything, an essential oil is bactericidal. And that's the last thing you wanna do is disinfect the mouth, which is where we still are and have been from the inception of toothpaste formulation design. Uh, it was designed to disinfect the mouth. You do not wanna disinfect the mouth. In fact, if you can't find a toothpaste that doesn't do that, or it, yeah. Um, it's better off not to use toothpaste. Uh, I would just dry brush and floss uh, because these toothpaste and mouthwashes that, that are designed to disinfect the mouth are taking down your oral microbiome, which actually cause bad breath, decay, uh, gum disease, and even high blood pressure. So make sure your toothpaste is supporting the oral microbiome, not trying to disinfect it. 
Uh, why would you do that for the gut? Why would you take antibiotics for the gut? I mean, it, obviously it sets you back, right? You're hitting on a bigger issue, which we're going to come back to is which diseases other than gum disease are, are born in the mouth. Uh, but but I'll, I'll segue there because mouthwash is something I've seen you take a pretty strong stance on. Let's talk about mouthwash, why you're anti-mouthwash. Same category as toothpaste, a little different. It was kind of a... It was something that came literally out of the back of that snake oil salesman covered wagon. It was a, a, a essential oil, very strong. It was m meant to burn, and and it was a eucalyptus oil typically, which is what Listerine uh, that model or that formula is based on. And people back in the Wild West, I mean, they had rotting teeth. They, their diet wasn't optimal. It was difficult to get fresh vegetables. Uh, they were eating a lot of meat, which was good, but there was a lot of decay in the Wild West. And that's what appeared at this market for, we can fix that. If you have tooth pain, uh, I think tooth pain has shaped world history. Wild West, certainly, uh, especially if you're a gunfighter or or someone, you know, uh, chasing criminals. I mean, this, this was a difficult job. And if you're sitting there on your horse riding endlessly all day long and you're in tooth pain, uh, you're just not going to be very efficient at your job. So, so the mouthwash still is a disinfectant for the mouth. And most of them are quite strong. That kills a portion of the oral microbiome, mostly on the back of the tongue. These are bacteria that produce or that break down the nitrates in vegetables into nitrites and produce nitric oxide. And of course, nitric oxide is this wonderful uh, gas, very short-lived, that uh, lowers our blood pressure. And, it's, and it helps peripheral blood flow. It helps with oxidative stress. It helps with uh, mood. And as we get older, we aren't able to produce it as much. The one, and most of that comes from endothelial cells and the blood vessels and other parts of the body. But by age 40, we've lost that ability, but there's one mechanism that can still go strong to the, to, to the end of our days. And that is this oral microbiome producing NO. And there are plenty of products down the market that you, where you can test that and see if you have the right oral microbiome for it. But mouthwash, we have plenty of studies. They're over 20 years old. Uh, mouthwash that is meant to disinfect your mouth, which is what most mouthwashes are designed to do, elevates your blood pressure by quite a bit. And the reverse is true. Uh, the, the, the effect of it is, is, is uh, reversed in six to seven days of, of, of ceasing the use of mouthwash. And concurrent with that, there's a new study out now, I think there are two of them, where if you tongue scrape, you can actually lower your blood pressure. So obviously I'm recommending at Ask the Dentist and, and on our Instagram account, stop using mouthwash. You can use salt water if you want, or baking soda and water, or just water. But the action of swishing really doesn't move the needle as much as brushing with a paste. If you need to reduce biofilm and reintroduce minerals back in your teeth, mouthwash is not going to do that. If you have a strong biofilm swishing with something, unless it's acid, you're not going to dissolve and break down that biofilm. It's the mechanical action of brushing adding some toothpaste to help boost your saliva, mineral content of saliva. Saliva is a super saturated solution of minerals, hydroxyapatite, calcium, chloride, potassium, boron, magnesium. Uh, mouthwash doesn't do that. It's a waste of your money. At, at best, it's a waste of your money. At worst, which typically it is, it's, it's having systemic effects. It's elevating your blood pressure. So beyond blood pressure, what other diseases or systemic effects you believe begin in in the mouth with oral health? Yeah. So specifically with mouthwash, there's one other effect of mouthwash, and that is insulin resistance. It it increases that as well. But in terms of diseases in the mouth, oral disease, inflammation in the mouth, essentially is a metabolic disease enhancer. And it is connected and linked to many chronic diseases. Probably 70% of chronic diseases have some involvement with an oral bug. And this all relates to the oral microbiome dysbiosis. So if your microbiome in your mouth is off, maybe you're using the wrong oral care products, maybe you're mouth breathing, maybe you're eating too many carbohydrates, usually it's a combination of all of that. Uh, your body mass indexes, affected blood pressure, triglycerides are elevated, your A1C and fasting blood glucose will, again, these are all the, the elements of metabolic disease. And if you have oral disease, 
this will be enhanced. Uh, it is a it's an amplifier of other diseases. If you have inflammation in the mouth, it, it, it can make other diseases worse. And then, of course, you've got the connection between Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer. Let's talk about brain health. I think brain health, cognitive decline, specifically Alzheimer's, is, is on the rise and many find absolutely frightening. And, and that's not one, you know, I think about gum disease. Okay, got it. You know, blood pressure. Oh, wow. I'm kind of surprised that. But then I think about cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, oral health. Wow, you've got my attention now. Right. And of course, high blood pressure uh, contributes to Alzheimer's, uh, to that microvasculature in the brain. But um, yes, uh, lots of data on that. Studies now for probably the good ones, at least now for eight years. Uh, there's a bug in the mouth called the P. gingivalis bug which is associated, it's one of the big players in gum disease. And that unfortunately is able to cross the blood brain barrier. It gets into the bloodstream via the gums. Uh, we can talk about that if you want, how that works, but, and it gets into the bloodstream and to the brain. And when the brain sees that P. gingivalis, it lays down amyloid plaque. Uh, there are 10 other reactions to the mitochondria of the brain, the myelin sheath. Uh, it, it, the brain swells. Um, there is a sudden and sustained reaction to the, to the brain, the immune system in the brain, if someone has chronic gum disease. There's a, it's the gingipan. There's a agent that uh, has been studied. I think it was discovered at UCSF in San Francisco, the researchers, and that already, that research is now six to eight years old. And of course they're targeting that. If they could suppress that with a pharmacological agent, then they're hoping that they could probably reduce Alzheimer's by, by a lot. I mean, uh, so it's, it's frightening. And I think a lot of people are listening to this and they're wondering, you know, do I have gum disease or if they have been told that they have gum disease, it's all reversible. If you start today on reversing gum disease and improving other aspects that contribute to gum health, uh, sorry, to gum health, but also to, uh, brain health this this can be addressed but again mouthwash toothpaste that is designed to disinfect the mouth which causes a dysbiosis of the oral microbiome p gingivalis bug uh, uh numbers elevate that causes gum disease that crosses into the bloodstream to the brain i mean it could be that i mean we've had this wrong for a long time we've seen a big increase in the incidence of alzheimer's I would say one big aspect of it is dentistry, poor recommendations as far as oral, oral care. So you mentioned tongue scraping as something everyone should do, you know, throw out, throw out the mouthwash, pick up a tongue scraper. What does that look like? Is that something you do twice a day? Like walk us through how someone can integrate tongue scraping into their routine. So tongue scraping is the, uh, the most underappreciated aspect of oral care. Um, and I would, I would not underestimate it. Uh, and everyone should be uh, tongue scraping. It doesn't mean you have to tongue scrape forever, but in the beginning, find a good tongue scraper. You, want, you don't want something on the end of your toothbrush, you know, on the backside of your toothbrush head. That's just not, that would take too long and you wouldn't be able to cover the whole tongue. You want a bow-shaped instrument where you grab on both sides. It can be a flexible piece of plastic with little teeth in it. It can be a smooth piece of stainless steel. And you would basically reach back as far as you can on the tongue, stick your tongue out, and you would drag this forward a few times along your tongue. In the beginning, it, you're going to see this, uh, I'm trying to, it's a kind of a tan colored solution. That's typically what people will scrape off of their tongue. Uh, and remember, the tongue is like a shag carpet, or it's like a carpet with little mushrooms. That's how the that's how the taste buds are shaped. And so you've got the heads or the caps of the mushrooms and there's all that space underneath that that is building up with uh, just food debris and, and especially if you're mouth breathing and, and that needs to be opened up and cleaned out. And that's what you're pulling off with the tongue scraping. You're kind of uh, agitating the sea of mushrooms uh, and opening it up and getting fluid in there, getting saliva in there, which is again, that elixir of health in the mouth and you're disturbing that. And now if you had a perfect diet, you wouldn't have to do this, but 
So do that in the beginning. You may even pull a little blood off the tongue. That's inflammation. Uh, you're disrupting the biofilm on the tongue, but you're allowing those bacteria that produce nitric oxide, for example. Uh, there are other functions as well. There's the taste bud ability to taste things. There's a, uh, some new research out, two studies that just came out on satiety is not linked to stretching of the stomach receptors. That's what I learned in dental school. Uh, it's based on the amount of flavor that you're getting on the tongue. So if you're not tongue scraping, you're probably overeating because you're not tasting your food. Wow. So you're breaking apart what's built up on your tongue. Most people, when they stick out their tongue, if they're not tongue scrapers, I could tell them exactly what parts of the tongue are affected, what kind of bacteria are growing there. You can even see food debris in the tongue. There are a lot of nooks and crannies in the tongue. So you just want to sweep that and clean it out. Do that for a few months, maybe a few weeks until that fluid is gone. Once a day or is that a twice a day thing? I would, I mean, I'm, when I get information like this, I tend to go at it and, and almost overdo it. So I would say two, three times a day until that fluid disappears and then check in every once in a while. So I tongue scrape every third or fourth day, or if I know I've been bad on my diet, any kind of processed car, uh, refined carbohydrate will lead to a improper biofilm formation on the tongue. Interesting. If anyone's ever gone to a, a TCM practitioner, traditional Chinese medicine acupuncturist, or you know, the, they, they always have you stick out your tongue and they look at your tongue. Exactly. You can tell a lot from the tongue, and and if you have bad breath, don't mouthwash actually makes it worse. You smell good. It's like deodorizing something with a spray. It smells good for about ten minutes, and then the the odor, the sulfur, the broken down sulfur bonds sulfide bonds uh, comes back and you get that dead fruit uh, smell and taste. So so scrape your tongue, definitely. It's easy to do. Once you get in the habit, uh, it's, it's, and plus it has other effects too with anything to do with nitric oxide. I mean, it can lower your blood pressure. We talked about that study earlier. It can literally lower your blood pressure. Why wouldn't you want to scrape your tongue? I, I think you've sold everyone. You know, I, th I think you've mentioned diet a few times and I think we've got an audience that believes you know, food is medicine. And so what's on, how, how do we eat better for our oral health? What should be on our grocery list? Right. Uh, that's a pretty easy answer. I mean, because the mouth is connected and part of the body. And, and we talked earlier about how, uh, I mean, disease in the mouth is also, is, is part of that metabolic disease uh, quotient. And, and if you have diabetes, it's going to make things in the mouth worse. If you have gum disease, it, it exaggerates, it makes it more difficult to control your blood sugar levels. It's all connected. So whatever you're doing for a, a, a you know, lowering your blood pressure, keeping your weight, your, your BMI low, BMI has been picked on recently. It's probably not a great indicator anymore, but being lean, uh, having muscle mass, uh, keeping your, your uh, cholesterol and triglyceride levels well balanced, not necessarily low. It's all about the ratio of all the good and bad um, or, uh, or fluffy, you know, LDLs, uh, and also your A1C. I, I would say any food, if you're wearing a CGM, which a lot of my patients do, especially if I'm treating them for gum disease, uh, because they're connected, um, you would want to make sure your A1C and your fasting blood glucose is optimal. Any food, and again, we all know what that is, right? That's a paleo diet, ancestral diet, lots of vegetables, fiber, stay away from crackers and goldfish and candies and cakes and even flour um, and breads. So you've mentioned eating meat also. You mentioned that earlier. And I'm assuming there's a correlation with eating meat, not only beyond the nutrients, but jaw strength and chewing. And am I, is it fair to assume no, no, there's definitely um, something to talk about there. Uh, so our ancestors, obviously, they became good cooks. I mean, it took chimps, it takes chimps about five to six hours to chew for what they need in terms of caloric intake and, and, and vitamins and nutrients. Uh, and we don't have time for that. And if you read, for example, if you read the book Sapiens, uh, which is a fantastic read, one of the points that he makes is that when we were able to start cooking our food and it took less time to eat and we were able to digest it more uh, or better, 
because it was cooked or broken down, uh, we became that much more of a superior species. I mean, superior is not the right word, but but uh, but if you look at today's diet, even to cooked meat or certainly raw meat, raw foods, um, we have lost an edge there in terms of development. Our jaws are smaller. They've, we've lost our width. We've lost our depth of the jaw. That vertical. Uh, growth and forward growth, which in turn has affected our airway and made us uh, very poor sleepers, has increased the incidence of sleep apnea. So chewing, especially when the child is developing from age, from from the first moment that they can chew, and that's sometimes before the teeth come in, And but baby food's pureed, it's watered down, it's mostly water and sugar. Uh, breast formula certainly doesn't apply uh, as a as a good food. Uh, breast milk is something different. The colostrum, of course, uh, that's not a chewing food. But as soon as the kid starts chewing, you definitely want them chewing on solid foods, and that doesn't include Cheerios or or bread or anything like that. You want them chewing because that chewing actually does have many effects, and that is on stimulating proper facial development and but also tongue posture and and other things that are related to this development. So our our ideal of beauty has changed with men and women. These small little angelic faces, V-shaped, small chins, uh, that's not how our ancestors looked. We look different than our ancestors. And is that something that beyond age seven, we can have an impact on teenagers, adults? Through tongue posture, breathing, chewing? Um, you picked an interesting age there. That's when most of facial development is done by age eight or nine. 90% of the facial development is done. So it would really, you'd really want to intervene earlier. The problem with modern orthodontics is that we're intervening after jaw development is done. All the teeth are in. Obviously, there's crowding. The jaw didn't get big enough. So the teeth that that come in, the set number that come in, they have no room. So what do they do? They start overlapping. They try and they move tip forward, tip backwards to to stack up properly. So really, that intervention preventatively first, like myofunctional therapy, uh, deal with tongue ties, mouth breathing obviously can affect facial development because we breathe differently. Uh, it even affects the development of our chest because we breathe not with our chest muscles properly, more diaphragm breathing. These are all things that affect how we turn out musculoskeletally shape, size, airway size. So before age seven, all that has to be addressed. See your dentist as soon as possible. I like to see my young patients within days of birth. We're checking for a tongue tie, then it's mouth breathing, then it'll be facial development. Chew solid foods. Uh, I know a lot of parents are nervous about that. I saw that struggle with my grandchildren. My daughter, knowing all this, obviously she would introduce solid foods more quickly than other moms did. And she was very concerned about choking, but they're fine as long as they are able to nose breathe. In other words, being able to breathe through your nose allows us to chew with our mouth closed. But if you can't breathe through your nose, you're, it's like when you have a cold, it's very difficult to chew food. Yeah. You know, we have, uh, we're big fans through James Nestor. We've had him on the show and James introduced us to Patrick McEwen, who we've also had on the show. And he's got a great mouth tape, oxygen advantage. So it just goes around the mouth. Myotape. Myotape. Yes. Fantastic. All right. We put it on our kids. We'll use it occasionally. It's really uh, game changing because the idea of taping your mouth shut, especially a child's mouth shut is horrifying. <laughs> right. Right. But it works. It does. But it goes around the mouth. This His tape goes around the mouth so the child can breathe or the adult can breathe through the mouth, but it really for, it really encourages. It's like a, a great nudge to breathe through the nose. I think it helps parents start that process and then they can graduate to regular tape. Uh, I've seen, I mean, I've, I would stay up late sometimes and watch my uh, patients go through a sleep study at the clinic and I would observe them and we would try mouth taping on kids. And if they struggled for air, the mouth would open and the tape would peel off. But mild tape is a great place to start. And I highly recommend it for anyone under age five or six, uh, but adults too. But mouth taping is wonderful. Uh, and and Patrick is absolutely amazing. Yes. Uh, so I think we, we covered a lot of the day-to-day -day and, and the way that I'm thinking about, you know, the, how, how we cover all we want to cover in this interview. You know, there's the day-to-day, 
Then there's, you know, the two to three times a year trips to the dentist. Uh, and then we've got the somewhat non-invasive or, or, or maybe very uncomfortable a la braces, Invisalign, mouth guards. And then we've got the invasive, you know, the root canals, the implants, the, you know, the um, my, my life is going to be disrupted for the next year or so. But l- let's go with the, the dentist. You know, I'm going to see my dentist. Maybe it's two to three times. I'll start there. How should one... And understood, I, I have a feeling I know what the answer is going to be here, but we, we are unique. But is there a rule of thumb in terms of what is the right frequency for you to visit your dentist? Right. Uh, that's a great question. Um, and and the typical professional answer is is a rubber stamp kind of answer where you should be seeing someone at least twice a year. I have a lot of patients that I see once a year, sometimes every two to three years. It the, you can customize that to the patient, but that's not conducive to practicing. And and then it depends on what kind of dentist you're seeing. We can talk a little bit about that, but there's functional dentistry, like functional medicine, and then there's conventional dentistry. And and so the answer, the the immediate answer is twice a year. The problem is, is that half of Americans are not seeing a dentist on a regular basis. Really? Yeah, which is really sad. And and it's for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's costly. Uh, dental insurance really is not a true insurance product. Medicare doesn't have any dental coverage. A lot of my elderly patients who were working at Apple or Intel, for example, as soon as they retired, they would come see me on an unneeded basis. And that's not what you want to do when you have gum disease and you're headed towards... So is that... You know, let's just talk about that for a moment and we're going to come back to the dentist. Is that part of the big issue structurally in that dentists are, are, they're small businesses, uh, people have to pay out of pocket and I'll just stop right there. Whereas insurance plays a significant role in what people value or choose to focus on with their health. And many people, if you've got a dental issue, you just blow through your deductible like that and it's all out of pocket. Whereas with traditional care, if I've got something wrong with a limb or an organ, most ins- most good insurance has your back, you're covered. Was so that a, a big part of the the why? In your opinion? I think it is. Uh, I mean, dentistry and medicine separated in 1839. We kind of got kicked out of the club um, for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, some were well justified. Uh, funnily enough, though, they, the physicians had a toothache would still come see us. But, but anyway, and since then, medicine and dentistry have been uh, kind of uh, have these uh, kind of non-converging parallel paths. I feel like they don't talk to each other. Exactly. There's no connective tissue between the two. And I think most physicians, their education is that the mouth is, well, that's that's the realm of the dentist and it's just hard tissue and there's no one systemic involvement. And unfortunately, things are changing a little bit. But, but because of that, because of that one fact, there are two different products, uh, insurance products. And one is dental insurance and one is medical insurance. Medical insurance typically is a true insurance product where if you get into a car accident, they, they, you know, the insurance keeps paying out until you, until you're better. Or if you have a chronic disease, it, it keeps going where dental insurance, it's not really insurance. It's not an insurance product. It's more of a benefit. It, it only pays out maybe a thousand to 1500, maybe 2000. There were some $2,000 plans, uh, per year. And after that you're on your own. And then, but initially you pay a deductible, uh, if you go see a dentist for that year, and then maybe your cleaning is covered hundred percent, but anything after that has very high co-payments, 20, 50, 80% co-payments. So, and plus then you max out. So that is a factor in the poor oral health. And I would argue poor systemic health because they're connected, uh, in this country. And I've spoken to uh, Congress uh, about this, and we really need to have a Medicare needs to cover dental and oral health 100%. And that would reduce the, the, the incidence of Alzheimer's and chronic diseases, and it would impact greatly financially the outlay of cost uh, of, of money spent on Medicare. So they, 
you're right. That is a big factor because the two professions operate separately in two uh, parallel universes. Uh, they have separate products and the dental product is absolute crap. So, so building off of the dental product, I'll go, we're going back to, okay, we're, we're, we're at the dentist and fluoride inevitably will come up. Is that why, why does fluoride come up? It, it seems like there's a developing, let me, let me rephrase this. It feels like over the past couple years, there seems to be more research coming out, essentially saying it's not necessary and it's potentially harmful. But that doesn't seem to be the case the moment I step into the dentist chair. If, 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 if it's here, it is for, for children and adults. And should we be thinking about children and adults differently? So is your view, this is a, a non-starter for, for ch children and adults? And then the, the part two of this question is, well, why is this the case? Yeah. Well, you, you, you put that very well, um, into context where, uh, there are a lot of dentists that are not recommending or recommending against fluoride. There is no research on fluoride back when it first came out again, much like Sudafed. Sudafed was pulled off the shelves at CVS. I mean, there was, it, it was approved in 1938, but there was no data. Same thing with fluoride. But now we have research on fluoride, 15, good solid research, 15 years of it on its effect on the brain. Uh, it lowers your child's IQ by four to nine points. Uh, and a pregnant mother can affect her fetus. It starts then. So, but you're right. I mean, and, and this is what I get a lot on Instagram. It's like, I've been shamed by my dentist because I turned down fluoride. I know better and I've read the research. It's, it's on the web. You have to dig deep for it because it is, it doesn't pop up. There's a lawsuit against the EPA, which is going to conclude next week. I'm going to be there uh, in San Francisco at the federal courts. This is something I've been waiting for for 40 plus years, maybe longer. All my daughters were raised without fluoride from way back when. The oldest is 36. Uh, and back then I didn't have the research, but I just had a bad feeling. It was a lesser of two evils argument. But now we have the research. It's been approved by the NTB, uh, National Toxicology, Toxicology Board, uh, 93% of the research has been approved. Um, I think we, I think that's needed. Two things are needed. There needs to be something, a national, something that happens in the federal courts, which I think will happen soon, where uh, fluoride is exposed for what it is, for dentistry to change. And then also you need to give dentists a way to bill for something else. Uh, the fluoride treatment and the fluoride varnish that that is a big money maker in a dental practice and it's the hygienist that does it it takes a few minutes i mean i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that we need to keep our dentists in business and but not with fluoride we cannot expose our kids to fluoride there, there's a mismatch with financial incentive these are small businesses that i think every dentist goes into everyone who goes into the field of medicine wants to help people and, and become a healer and if this is what they've learned in medical school and, and also financially this is something i get reimbursed for i'm gonna do it until proven otherwise, or there's another incentive because these are small businesses. Incentives need to be aligned. Uh, what about some of the other things? If I sit in my dentist chair, I, th I think x-rays, I think cleaning, I think teeth whitening. Walk us through those briefly. X-rays are a big deal. A lot of moms ask about that as they should. Uh, you know, uh, ionizing radiation, uh, it uh, methylates DNA. Uh, too much of it is, is bad. Uh, some of it is okay. A little bit of it is okay. Um, but unfortunately, dentists have a protocol. They take x-rays every six months, every 12 months. Some offices are every two years. It really should be based on what the dentist or hygienist sees. So I would go to a, a dental practice where the dentist sees you before the cleaning starts and makes an assessment. Uh, rather than after. Most dental practices have the dentist come in later. And of course, he sees a clean mouth. The hygienist has done a great job, right? So, uh, and then the dentist, the hygienist is recommending x-rays. So th there has to be a very good reason to take x-rays. And x-rays are definitely overused. X-rays are not perfect. We have newer x-rays. We have digital x-rays. If you do get an x-ray, make sure it's digital, not a film-based x-ray. The dosage is much, much lower. There are some things your dentist cannot see, but even an x-ray can mislead a dentist. It's not perfect. These are little shadows. It's not, you know, you take, you don't take an x-ray and then there's like a little X marks the spot. That is definitely a cavity. You definitely have to go in and, and fix it. 
it's not that simple. So it has to be nuanced. It has to be done based on need. Uh, I would do as little as possible on kids. Uh, baby teeth, you can use a very bright light. I used to use a transillumination device, a very strong uh, battery, uh, you know, a, a cordless machine with uh, powerful batteries in it. It was handheld and it would focus the light down to a very small fiber optic tip. And through baby teeth, you can shine that light. And baby teeth aren't as as beefed up, as, as thick, they have thinner enamel and they're, they're more translucent. You can literally see cavities with that. So use transillumination. There are alternatives. Uh, but sometimes an x-ray is needed. Let's say you have a root canal that is, you know, you're tap sensitive and you're feeling a little soreness. You need a three-dimensional cone beam x-ray because the root canal is, if that goes bad, that's worse than the amount of ionizing radiation. So again, ionizing radiation, you, you gotta, I would keep a diary of how many x-rays you're getting and ask for the dosage. And that includes your physician. Chest x-rays are, are, are you know, they, they just, every time you start coughing and hacking and there's, you, they think you have pneumonia, they, they tell you to get a chest x-ray. So um, what else? So whitening. Uh, whitening is bad for your teeth. Um, I'm not saying don't do it. Certainly don't do it on your own at home. Make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, if the dentist pulls out a special light and leaves the room and has painted your teeth with something, that probably is not a good sign. There's very good. There's very little good data on these LED lights, especially at home. Uh, the best way to whiten your teeth is to use a carbamide peroxide-based gel, about 10%, in a custom-made tray. Don't overfill the tray so that it touches your gums. Place the tray, leave it in for a half hour, do that for a few weeks. That is the safest way to whiten your teeth. Uh, and that should be done. Now, the, the tray should be, um, for example, if you have Invisalign trays, that would be perfect. But make sure you're getting it done or it's demonstrated to uh, professionally. Uh, the Europeans are very strict on whitening. Uh, we're out of control here. You can buy this stuff on Amazon up to 35%. And the Europeans have capped it for children. No whitening on children up until age 17 or 18 Ten percent only. After that, uh, it's 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 a uh, it's the wild wild west here when it comes to whitening in the U.S. A lot of things are the wild wild west. It, it's a strong oxidizer. It's it's tough on the tooth structure, and it can cause pulpitis. And so, is there anything we should know about the the cleaning process that we should be aware of or raise with our dentist? So we got the memo on X-rays. We got the memo on fluoride, whitening, hard 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 po or hard pass. Excuse me. We're gonna going to pivot to your method. What about the, should we make any requests with the cleaning? Something I found personally is I hate the machine. So I always say, do it by hand. They don't like it, but they do it. I don't like it. Well, we used to do it by hand uh, with carbon steel instruments, uh, which is still a, a great way to go. Um, you'd have to make sure that your hygienist is sharpening their instruments properly and has the technique and has the muscle memory. It takes a lot of strength and and it's it's a different type of the ultrasonic the one that you don't like that has a it rattles up against the teeth it it does set off a lot of people it's uncomfortable a lot of people can't even use a sonic uh toothbrush for that reason kids are very sensitive to that sonic uh and that's good at bulk removal of tartar and calculus um but when it comes to really cleaning the tooth properly it's typically a combination of ultrasonic or piezoelectric uh, device. And then that's the bulk removal. Hopefully you don't need a lot of that. And then going to the hand instrumentation and good sharp instruments uh, and good technique and someone who does it on a regular basis. It, it is a, it, it's muscle memory based. And that's how I recommend, and you do need to get your teeth cleaned. Some need to get it cleaned four times a year. Depends on how much tartar you build up. And tartar is a function largely, you know, are we mouth breathing? Are we eating the right foods essentially? Yep. You know, you mentioned the different kind of schools of, of dentistry. Obviously there's traditional Western and then there's, there's functional, there's biological holistic. If we were to, to, to focus on those three, what, what are the differences between functional, biological and holistic? Right. Um, again, our fault. We've confused the consumer. We have all these different names. Uh, uh, dentistry is very, even more fragmented than medicine. Medicine at least has these large hospital umbrellas, nonprofit organizations, group practices, where dentists are typically, we're, we're more, you know, we're, fragmented. It's a small businesses. As small businesses, sole proprietors, mavericks, cowboys, whatever you want to call it. 
And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and we have more control. And the good dentists are the ones that are not, that their treatment is not determined by what's paid for by the insurance plan or what can the patient afford. I mean, they're doing the right thing. Um, but when it comes to conventional dentistry, which is what we all end up with when we graduate from dental school, there's conventional dentistry. It's a great education. It makes us great clinicians. Uh, we need good clinicians. It's amazing what Western uh, dentistry can do, just like Western medicine, in terms of fixing things and making us look great and curing the, you know, addressing the symptoms. But it really should be more, there needs to be more emphasis on that functional approach, that upstream, what is the root cause of disease so that we don't have to deal with any of the symptoms. Medicine's gone through that. It's captured a small part of that market. Um, dentistry is going through the same thing. I've been modeling and, and promoting that for at least now 20 years and the needle is beginning to move in that. But what is a functional dentist? Uh, I, I like the term functional. I thought about this for a long time. I like the term functional because it covers everything integrative, biological, holistic, uh, uh, because holistic or like, for example, uh, biological only deals with safe materials. It focuses on safe materials, but it may not focus on airway and facial development. Functional is a broader term. So when I speak of a functional dentist, it may be that you're seeing a biological dentist and, and that's a good dentist to see, but maybe they're not airway focused. You would have to then get a referral to an airway focused dentist uh, in, in, that, in that case. And so where does one go about, a, a lot of people are asking the question, oh, great, where do I find one? Well, we have a directory on our website and that kind of was happen chance because, you know, my daughter and I, who have been doing this website now for 10 plus years, we ended up, we realized that we ended up educating all of our followers and, and that was great. Uh, and, you know, they had open minds and they had questions and, and they wanted to know why am I getting so many cavities, for example. But then we spoke about the functional approach and then the comeback then what we were seeing is like, well, okay, who do I go see? And I couldn't, I mean, I was getting people from out of state and, you know, I couldn't handle that load. So, so it was one of our staff members that came up with the idea, we should have a directory and we should vet these dentists because they're out there. There are functional dentists. And so we built, we only have about 200, maybe 250 worldwide. Um, and most of them sought us out, but we sought out some of them. Some of them we knew were, were ones that we wanted on the list. And they pay to be on the list, they are vetted, uh, and we are beginning to and have already started providing them continuing education. They're hungry for this information, they get it. They've had their own health issues, whether it was systemic or even oral health related, and they understand the functional approach. They understand that's not just all about treating symptoms and that modern healthcare is about 15, 20 years behind all the new research. So, so they're, they're eager, they're well-educated, and they have a good conventional dental uh, background. They're, they're great clinicians. And so integrating that into a functional approach is the kind of dentist that you want to see as a patient. It's fantastic. We will definitely link to that directory in our show notes. So we'll move on to the, the somewhat non-invasive, uh, very uncomfortable treatments. And I'll start with one that I think is fairly popular, Invisalign. Is that okay by you? Absolutely. Love the product. Uh, worked alongside them in, in Santa Clara, which is where they started. Uh, that is a great product. Very non-invasive. It, it makes more sense than conventional brackets and braces. Although Invisalign can't, can't do all, it can't do the difficult cases, although they've gotten better. The material is, is pretty safe, pretty inert, makes a great whitening tray and a, and a great night guard if you're mountain biking or skiing, I, I always pop in my Invisalign in case I fall. So great product. What about traditional braces for, for kids? Uh, fine, not a problem. More difficult to clean around. Uh, it needs a lot of care and attention to prevent decay or decalcification marks on the teeth, which are difficult to remove cosmetically. The problem with orthodontic care is that it should be done at age two, three, or four. And how how willing is a small kid to get brackets and wires? It's all about convenience. When you go see a surgeon, pretty much everything, you know, getting knocked out completely, that's, that's all for the convenience of the surgeon. Obviously, you don't want to feel a lot of the pain, but but surgeons make their life easier because they're doing surgeries all day, and that that that's okay. But it's the same thing in dentistry. Orthodontists are treating kids when they feel that they can intervene. 
at 12 and 13, but that's, you haven't, then you're dealing with a small jaw and you're taking teeth out to make room for the other teeth. So it's really about intervening early and good orthodontists, functional orthodontists, orthotropic orthodontists, there are all sorts of different names, of course, again, very fragmented, but ones that are enlightened, they are treating earlier without the brackets and wires and they are expanding the arch with a device that gets placed temporarily or permanently. The parent will, uh, at nightly, turn a little screw on the palate and, and widen the arch, promote proper facial development so that when it comes time for all the adult teeth to erupt, there's no need for brackets and wires or even Invisalign. Interesting. What about mouth guards? Mouth guards, uh, I made a lot of mouth guards in my career because uh, I saw a lot of bruxism. Then I realized that bruxism, grinding your teeth at night or during the day, now we have sleep bruxism because we've realized that the etiology, the reason for grinding, there are many different reasons. There's sleep bruxism, which is related to a collapse of the airway. There's a theory out there that the muscles tighten up from complete being completely relaxed in REM, no muscle tone to the airway collapsing. You stop breathing for 30, 40, 50, 60, 90 seconds. There's a sudden an arousal and that moment of grinding your teeth is what literally wakes you up and stiffens the airway muscles and, and wakes you up. So that's sleep bruxism. Um, the problem is, is that the night guards, so Dennis would see, I, I can go to a party and I can just from conversational distance, I can tell you and it drives my wife nuts, but that's a different story. I can tell you and I tell her, I can tell you who is grinding and who's grinding at night, just based on the shape of the teeth. Am I grinding? Oh, I don't know, I have to see your teeth up close. Uh, I mean, it's really, uh, all the teeth are the same height, and then they're wear facets, and you can see that. You don't, you know, you can just see that in a conversational, let me expand the screen here, <laughs> hang on. So if, if, all, if all your teeth are the same height, you're grinding. Yeah, exactly, smile for a second. No, I mean, you may clench, but your, your incisors are longer than your laterals. You have crowns, those are crowns crown this is a uh sorry crown and i had an implant okay we'll, we'll we'll touch on that as we get to the invasive the fun stuff yeah yeah but you know if you have wear facets on your teeth which are visible on the front teeth uh that that is an indication that a, the, a dentist would want to protect those teeth so we start you know making all these night guards and there, there are plenty of studies out there saying that you should first address the sleep make sure that there is no chance of sleep apnea because the night guard can make the sleep apnea worse. Yes. So be very careful. Be very careful. So we'll move on to the invasive. And we'll start with one which everyone has unless they choose to remove it. Wisdom teeth. What's your take on wisdom teeth? I love them. They're great. I wish we could keep them in our mouths. But again, they're the last teeth to erupt. Uh, and if you have a small jaw and you've had braces already, th these teeth erupt around college um, or or right before military service. And that's why the military takes them out because you could be out on the front lines and all of a sudden you get this pericornitis, tooth erupts at an angle or it's impacted and it is absolutely mind bending pain. It'll shut you right down and it can get infected. So we have this system in dentistry of prophylactic removal of wisdom teeth because we know that there's no room for them when they come in. We don't want them to mess up our orthodontic work but we're not, we, we haven't really talked about why this is the case. It's because the jaws are too small. And when that last set of four teeth come in, there's no room for them. So we do take them out. So I, I, I still have them. They're, they're in there. I don't visibly see them. I'm assuming I'm 49. Has the, has, has the ship sailed for someone like me who's in their, in their 40s and they don't really have a problem and they're still there? Because the last thing I want to do, my view is like, I don't want to have a surgery. Right. Well, I mean, it's, um, so your risk of taking them out is much higher as an adult. Uh, it's easier to take them out before the roots are fully developed. We can roll them out. Uh, kids heal better. Their bone is softer. But the good news is that you still have them and you've had no complications. That means that your jaw developed to a point where they were able to erupt properly. I'm assuming that. Your dentist would tell you they're fully erupted. You don't have deep pockets. You don't have any gum disease or inflammation around them. No deep pockets, no gum disease. You're great. I mean, that's the way we were designed to have all 32 teeth. So in other words, for, for, for those listening, if you start to have an issue, this, this is one where you probably want to act 
sooner rather than later and get it done with. Right. So something I've had is a root canal. And I'll give you my history because I think there are a lot of people have root canals. Uh, in college, playing basketball, took an elbow and, and, had, and had to have a root canal. And about 10 years later, it started to get, it saw a new dentist. It looked like it was, or actually it's more like 15 years later now that I think about it, starting to go bad. So he took, did a, I think an apico where they, they went in. Apicoectomy, yes. Yeah. And then like essentially did another one. And then about another 10 years later, I never felt great about it. And the more I learned about however, you know, f functional medicine, your field or everything's connected. Like, I don't like the idea of this like dead thing being in there. And it, it always felt a little bit off, not pain, but like off tender. So I decided, you know what, like let's, and I, and I went to my very Western dentist at the time who, who was very Western. And I said, you know what, I don't feel great about this. You know, I, I, I want to maybe consider taking it out. And he said, I agree. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you've done a weight at 180 on this. And his view was, you know what? They, they, there's a good chance it will, in his words, I remember, blow up sometime in the future. And you're still relatively young. You're healthy. I'd rather you do this now than later in life. And so we went through the process. And it was a six-month process extracting the tooth. And then I had to wear a flipper, I think, for six months. and. Yeah, you probably had a bone graft. Bone graft. And, you know, I looked at, this is when I started to really dive deeper in your field. So I was like, you know what? I know a lot more. Like, let's try to do this in a way that was more aligned with my values and belief system. So looked at implants, titanium, ceramic, I believe zirconia. I couldn't do ceramic or zir zirconia because the, the, the opening, it wasn't a match. And what I'd also heard, which I thought was interesting because it was so, there was a chance that it wouldn't take and it would break. And I'm like, I'm so done with this process. Give me the titanium. I'm not doing this again. Right. But one of the things I struggled with um, was, <clears throat> you know, in, in the big picture, like, wow, how is everyone else navigating through this? Should everyone just take the tooth out immediately if they need a canal. And so like, let's spend a moment there and talk about root canals and subsequent implants and how people should be thinking about both. Cause they're related. Usually one leads to the other. Right. Oh, it's a very often asked question. Um, let's talk first about why we're getting root canals. Again, maybe we're not seeing a dentist on a regular basis. The decay, the cavity gets too deep, it grows. It, it infects the pulp, the living tissue inside the tooth, which has its own microvasculature, the tissue that's there is living. That tissue helped form the tooth. Uh, it's mesenchymal tissue um, and it gets infected. And because it's in a closed space, if there's any inflammation of that tissue, which is inevitable, that we call that pulpitis, uh, it is excruciating because, you know, when you get inflammation in other parts of the body, it's a, it can expand. But inside the tooth, it's constrained. It cuts off its own blood supply. It dies. Then it becomes necrotic, and that tissue can become very, very infected. So dentistry, and this goes back to the pharaohs in Egypt, they invented a way of mummifying the tooth. Uh, they would remove all the tissue. The theory is that they would remove all the tissue. It's a hard structure. It's a hard tissue. And once it's empty and filled properly, and no bacteria from any other area can come back in, that this would be a great way to save the tooth. And in in theory and in practice, that has worked well most of the time. Now, your tooth, which was from an elbow, uh, that reminds me of dental school. We actually broke some jaws. We played basketball with all the instructors. But anyway, it was pretty rough. Uh, but that happens a lot and small fracture occurs. And over time, that tooth starts getting sensitive. Uh, people fall off of horses, they, it's a car accident, and the pulp takes years, sometimes decades to die. It can be within six weeks, it depends. But those small fractures to the teeth will lead to pulpitis where the tooth dies and that tissue has to be removed. If done properly, and the older methods were horrible, the early method was putting in something, uh, putting in a compound called Sargenti paste, which was toxic. 
And it was fine inside the tooth until it leaked out the bottom of the tooth. You know, at, at the bottom of each root, there's a little area, a little foramen, a little small hole where the blood vessels and nerves would enter the tooth. So this Sargenti paste would exit, go into the bone and just kill all the bone and you'd get these large abscesses and then it could get into the bloodstream. And, and so that was outlawed. And that was before I came online as a dentist. So it, it wasn't outlawed until maybe the 70s. And then, but today we use ozone, we use uh, lasers to go in. It, it's a very technique sensitive uh, procedure. If you can disinfect the inside of that tooth properly and seal it, off, seal it off properly with gutta percha and all these new heated uh, pressure uh, kind of um, pushed uh, or, or uh, applied methods of sealing off the inside of the tooth, it can work. Uh, root canals have a bad name because of the root canals that fail, like yours did, that needed an apocoectomy, which is a heroic, that's heroic dentistry. The success rate of that is 50%, plus they're drilling through bone. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, right. So um, I think in, in summary, root canals have their place. The best would be to prevent ever needing a root canal. Uh, if you do need a root canal, see if it's a tooth that can be extracted without needing a replacement. There are two teeth in the in the body that I think that applies to. A lot of people get root canals in those teeth, and I think that's unnecessary. If it's a front tooth or a, a canine, get it root canaled. Make sure it's done by a professional, uh, by a, a specialist who does root canals all day long. He uses a microscope. He uses all the right techniques, laser to disinfect, ozone inside the tooth, and then check in with the tooth. Every two to five years, get a cone beam, get a three-dimensional x-ray, tap on the tooth if it's tender. As in your case, if it doesn't feel quite right, there's something wrong. I wouldn't do the apicoectomy. If it fails, it fails. Uh, root canals are difficult to do, especially the upper first molar, uh, lots of torturous canals, very complex uh, kind of inside chambers. But if it's done properly, it can last a lifetime and not give you any trouble. If it gives you trouble, take it out, put in an implant. And how do you think about implants? Implants aren't perfect. Um, uh, they came online when I was a young dental student. It was invented in Sweden, uh, the titanium implant. I, I think he was a physician actually, used for a long time in, in medicine uh, for prostheses and prosthetics. Um, we used to think the body, the osteocytes, the bone cells loved titanium and would glom onto it and integrate with the implant. That does happen, but the original story was a little too rosy. Titanium oxides uh, do cause gum issues. Some people are sensitive to uh, titanium oxides, the coatings and the byproducts of the titanium coating. Uh, and that's why zirconia now is in place. Zirconia is a little bit more brittle, although they've improved on it a lot. I'm okay with implants. It's more important to restore the function of that tooth for longevity, for quality of life, for digestion, making sure you're getting all your nutrients. Also cosmetics. I mean, you don't want to be toothless in front. That's not a good good life, right? So I, I'm okay with it. It just You just have to have the right practitioner, a good clinician, pick the right materials, and, and and for example, in the case of root canals, you got to be willing to kind of cut it loose when it's not working. Yeah, and look, I, I love your approach because it's practical. And when I started to go down this path, and I, and I had this conversation with many respected functional medicine doctors, who I will not name, on this subject, it was like when I look around at anyone in holistic they seem a little too kooky. Like I'm not trusting them. They don't seem balanced. And, and I, I love a lot of, there are a lot of great functional or integrative medicine docs where they are balanced, where it's like, okay, you need the surgery or you need the, you need to take the pharmaceutical or, you know, you need to like take a breath or eat more kale or, you know, take a supplement. And I was finding on this subject, it, it was feeling a little out there. And for someone who had been through the ringer, with their mouth, I'm like, you know what? I, I'm going to get a lot of information and, and go this direction. But I was, then I discovered you. Uh, I wish I lived in California and I met you two years ago. But uh, yeah, I get why people struggle with this one. Well, there's a lot of kooky out there in dentistry. Absolutely. Yeah. Look at fluoride. Look at that one. Look at the fear of glycerin and toothpaste. It, it's all based on one engineer from Purdue that thought he, when he was retired, knew a lot about oral health. I mean, there's, and 
be wary of the person who bases it on old, I, w I won't even use the word research, but comments that got transferred to the web or maybe from a small pamphlet. The, the Fear of the Root Canal was a very small book. Uh, and again, there, go with the science. There's lots of science out there. And if your dentist seems a little too kooky or a little too weird and won't cite studies or support why or why not, something should be done, then you should move on. And then the other option, and this is what we're doing at Ask the Dentist, is the, you know, it, healthcare has been democratized. It's it's on the web. You can educate yourself very easily. Sometimes just by following someone on Instagram, you may not be getting all the details, but you find someone you trust that is talking about studies and being practical, uh, and then be knowledgeable before you go in and agree to a procedure. I love that advice. And, you know, something else where I think we're, we're seeing a lot of in 2024 and the last couple of years of veneers and crowns. I have one because when I had to do my front tooth, the dentist recommended, he said, one, aesthetically, you want the teeth to match. I'm like, okay. But more importantly, when you're doing the, essentially, the, the, when we're pulling that tooth out, the flipper is going to have more success if we grind this one down so that's stable. I didn't love the idea of it, but I did it. Uh, so I have one. And I remember when I had the flipper, there were times where I'm like, this chute that we grinded down is a little too painful right now. Is that normal? I felt like, and he's like, yeah, you probably have some trauma. But I have one. I know I'm not alone. A lot of people get veneers and crowns. So let's talk about that. You know, I used to, I used to do a lot of veneers and I loved doing it. It was the artistic aspect of uh, of my work, and I was a history of art major before I was a biochem major. And it's sculpture, it's color, it's chromatism, it's uh, color values, it's shape, it's interacting all that with a person. It's their identity, their self image. I mean, it's you know I've got tons of incredible stories of changing people's lives. So, but the problem with cosmetic dentistry is that it's oversold. And so I would usually try and talk the patient out of it because it's expensive. It's not covered under insurance. You know, one veneer, a good veneer will cost $1,700 to $2,500. Uh, and the lab, the lab fees are expensive and it doesn't last forever and they can fall out. And, you know, and you get a bride coming in two weeks before the wedding and she's hot to trot to, or sometimes a groom actually, and and they just want it all done. And it's, that's not the time to do it uh, and be wary. And there are a lot of dentists that are overselling it and then they all fall off or the, there's decay underneath it. So you have to be very careful. It's a very expensive item, but I do like cosmetic um, dentistry. And the porcelain veneer is amazing what it can do to someone's life in terms of interpersonal relationships, work, uh, happiness, uh, all of that. But again, be careful. And and as a dentist, I would say, be careful who you're working on. A lot of patients come in and think this is the solution for all their problems in their personal lives, and it can actually make things worse. Uh, so be, be very careful. But it's a great, it's one of the great things that dentistry can do for someone. So in closing, where do you see this field going or where do you want it to go? What, what do you want to change? I, well, ideally, I would like it to go where I want it to go. And I think we're headed that way. Um, it it needs to, it, there has to, I guess, to make it simple, there has to be more respect for the oral microbiome. We need to do research. We can now test for the oral microbiome. We have this very simple test, broad spectrum, uh, shotgun genomic uh test that tests for all bacteria in the mouth. Do you have that specifically? Do you, do you? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Can we link to that in the show notes? It's a uh, cold bristle. I'll give you the link. It's wonderful. Uh, it's only been out for maybe a year and a half. Uh, I would like it. I would like if dentists and, and they are, but it's not mainstream yet where everyone gets tested for the oral microbiome and that dentists and patients alike have respect for this oral microbiome, have an understanding, a comprehension of why it's the root of there's that word again, of everything uh, when it comes to oral health, but also it's the root for a lot of the majority of things that happen in the body. So if we can just start thinking and practicing that way and patients can come in and pre-select a dentist that, or a physician that thinks that way, this would move the needle and it also help protect our children. I'd love to get rid of fluoride. That's gonna happen soon, I think. Federal lawsuit is going to end up, uh, hopefully uh, he'll rule 
here in San Francisco and it'll probably be, we'll probably hear something middle of February on that. That's around the time this podcast will uh, air. It's going to be interesting. And, you know, the EPA has done a, DOJ has done a terrible job of defending themselves. They've admitted on recorded depositions that they were wrong on this. They don't have research that it does cause inflammation of the brain. The NTV has approved uh, over, I think it's 79 studies from Canada, Mexico, China, the US, mm -hmm. that there is a correlation between lower IQ and mom's drinking of fluoride. And, and it's also toothpaste. Toothpaste gets absorbed through the oral mucosa. So if you go in and get a, a fluoride varnish, let's say your kid gets that that yucky stuff at the end of their visit and they have to keep it on for a half hour, they can't drink and they can't eat, that's called the fluoride varnish. That is loaded with fluoride. I mean, toothpaste is 15, 1200 parts per million. That's up to 50,000 parts per million. And that goes right to the brain within 10 minutes. So we need we need a, we need better dentistry. We need a functional approach. We need to stop using and recommending all these terrible things, mouthwashes, toothpaste that are harming the oral microbiome. We really need to show the oral microbiome some respect. Agreed. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. That was fun.